Okay, so the seminars are recorded and they are posted um, usually a couple of weeks later or a week later um, on uh, the Kansas Biological Survey's website as long as the speakers are okay with that. So um, with, without further ado, I'll let Helen introduce our first speaker and thanks again for coming. Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Laura Downing from the Kansas Association of Conservation Education. Uh, oh, I did it wrong, Conservation Environmental Education. Shoot, <laughs> Laura will do it right when she says it herself. Um, KC is how it's known. And uh, this is an organization that I honestly learned about relatively recently, just a few years ago. But it's really impressive because this has been going on since 1969. Laura joined the staff in 1998. Um, they do a lot of different things in environmental education and outreach with the schools and other groups. Um, they have... Uh, yearly meetings. They had one in Lawrence a couple of years ago that I went to and got a lot out of. So anyway, we thought that it'd be great to have Laura come and tell us about her organization, um, because I think there's lots of people here that have interest in environmental <clears throat> ed. So Laura. So thank you so much, Helen, for um, inviting me here today. I'm really happy to be here. And um, and I'm going to apologize in advance because I am going to need to um, cut out right after I speak because I double booked myself today. So I apologize to Rob that I won't get to stay, but hopefully I'll get to watch the recording afterwards. So um, uh, as Helen said, I'm, I'm with the Kansas Association for Conservation and Environmental Education. Um, and we call ourselves Casey for obvious reasons. It's a big, long, lengthy name. And I thought I'd tell you, um, talk to you a little bit about today, um, about what environmental education is and why it matters and some of the research that's behind um, why this is an important thing that, we be, that we're doing. So the, the formal definition of what is environmental education really came out of the, the Tbilisi Declaration of 1977. And that was um, when uh, a UN group got together um, to, to talk directly about environmental education, environmental programming. And this is the long and lengthy definition that they came up with, um, but it is really about understanding and having the knowledge, values, attitudes, and skills to be um, responsible um, participants in our, um, in our world. And so we've somewhat adapted that um, definition and have come up with the following one. We really focus on developing critical thinking and problem solving skills and effective decision making skills, but we, but it is a process. Um, it's um, not environmental information where you're just putting something out there. It's really about engaging uh, the participants in learning. And we like to say that good environmental education also teaches kids how to think and not what to think about the environment. So um, we don't take a, a particular stand on environmental issues, but we we want kids to understand that there's lots of complexity to environmental issues and lots of different points of view around it. And having that deep understanding is what um, we hope will help them to become those effective decision makers in the future. So I wanna take just a moment and, and sort of lay the groundwork about why environmental education is important, at least why we think it's important and its impacts, um, the impacts of nature. And I want you to think for just a minute about your favorite childhood memories and think about where you were and what you were doing um, and try and visualize that in your head. And if you're like most of the groups that I get to talk with, the majority of you are thinking about someplace outside. Is that is that relatively true for folks? And you're welcome to pop that in the comments, but um, most people think about a favorite childhood memory, they think about being outside. and here's why environmental education is important with nature. Um, there's some, some great research that's out right now um, from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And they're finding that our kids today are spending less than half the time outdoors that we did um, as, uh, as children. And they're spending up to seven and a half hours a day on electronic equipment. And that is during their free time. That does not count the time that they're in school. And of course, with COVID, that <laughs> that's probably just gone up and up and up and up. Um, and that our kids in the United States have only about a half an hour of unstructured time outdoors um, every week. And why does that matter? 
um, a gentleman named Richard Louvre, who uh, used to work at the University of Kansas, um, coined this phrase, phrase nature deficit disorder. And he, he connected the rises in some serious issues that we're having with kids like AD, rises in ADHD and childhood obesity and, and lags in cognitive and conceptual development with decline of time um, that children are spending in nature and really made the case through this book, Last Child in the Woods, which if you have not read, I, I would encourage you to, that we need to be having our kids outdoors more often. It's good for them. Um, and the medical community is certainly taking note of this as well. And, and um, this was a really interesting piece of research that was done by a, a number of um, doctors and nurses actually. Um, and they were looking at what does children's play look like? And from the pictures you can see the play that we used to do as kids. And if you were like me at all, um, from the time that, uh, especially in the summertime, from the time that we got done with breakfast until the time that we came in for lunch, we were outside. And then we went back outside until we came in for dinner. And then we went back outside again until, um, well, our rule was when the street light turned on, but that's not how kids are playing today. And um, they did some, some significant research and looking at a whole host of um, impacts on children's health and some really surprising ones like um, having sleep apnea and sleep disorders among kids, which I couldn't even imagine, um, but lack of um, vitamin D, depression, cardiovascular disease in young kids, even rises in diabetes. And this might be the quote that like gut punched me the most um, in reading this research. And it's a projection that our kids today might be the first generation to have a shorter lifespan than the previous generation. And that just does not, has not been happening. So it really creates a strong case for getting kids outside. And, um, and there's so many positive benefits for getting kids outside and we want them outside learning obviously, but there's lots of informal learning that takes place outside as well. So it helps with cognition and focus. It can help with, um, improving attention. Um, so when you see those rises in um, ADHD, getting kids outside is especially good for kids who have uh, attention deficit disorder um, challenges. It can reduce stress. Um, it can help to address um, some of the medical and health issues that we, we related. And obviously it's, it's um, cost-effective and easily sustainable. So it's, it's a good thing for us to be doing. And it also has some really good, strong emotional and social um, benefits. And that includes um, fostering self, a sense of self-discipline in warmer and more cooperative relationships with people. So it helps us get along with each other a little bit better. And there's even data that says that um, uh, getting kids out in nature helps adults too. And you may have seen some of these. And actually I think one of, um, one of these uh, studies that I was looking at was done by somebody at KU, but uh, there's some very clear evidence that getting out in nature helps to reset uh, your uh, cognitive focus. Um, it helps to kind of recenter that place in your brain that pays attention to things um, and helps you to be clearer and, be, and better able to concentrate. So it's good for kids, it's good for adults, and it's not only good to get them out in nature, um, but it's also good to get them learning about the outdoors and the world around them. And so um, it's not just about getting them outside and, and playing and learning, but it's also about how that, that work benefits the environment. So I wanna do a little quick, and you can kind of play along at home here or wherever you are. We're gonna do a little environmental um, quiz. And this is a replication of a, uh, 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 some research that was done nationally where they asked adults 10 different questions. And I'm not gonna go through all 10 of them, but I would love for you to take some guesses on, or hopefully you know these, um, I'm imagining you might. But um, here's one of the first questions. And so they asked adults in the United States, how is most of the energy in the US generated? And if we were face to face, I'd ask you to call it out, but um, I hope that um, most of you 
because of the field that you're in and your interest um, gave the correct answer of A. We replicated this study also in Kansas and we found that um, on average, um, only about 41% of Kansans got this question correct. Um, this is a little bit dated, but nationally it was lower than that. Um, and the most common response nationally, which just I don't quite understand was um, D at hydroelectric plants, did not seem to make sense to me. So here's another example of a question. What's the most common cause of pollution in our streams, rivers, and oceans? And I was, I was kind of not surprised by what the responses were to this question. Um, only about a quarter of people nationally in Kansas, and excuse my graph making skills, um, there's not really that big of a difference between what happened nationally in Kansas, but um, uh, about a quarter of the people in Kansas knew the correct answer to this. And the most common response in Kansas was it was water dumped by factories. That made sense to me because I think it's easy for us to think that pollution is external from what we do. And it's not, um, it's not something that we directly con contribute to water pollution. Here's another example of a question. What do you think is the main cause of um, global climate change? And um, I'm really pleased that even uh, when this study was done about 10 years ago, that about half of Kansans were, are, were articulating the correct answer to this. Um, and um, again, not that huge of a disparity, but that means that about half the people in our state didn't get this right. So here's, I'm, I'm not gonna do all 10, but here's one last question for you. And this is um, uh, about, uh, landfills and, and waste. And so the greatest source of, uh, tr of trash and the people in our state, only about 25%, a quarter of them, one in four, got this correct. Um, and the most common question was D or the common response was D for the folks in Kansas. Um, and of course, the um, um, Oh my goodness, hang on, sorry. The correct answer should be C. I think I have this wrong, sorry about that. So what's the point of this? The study findings were that about only three in 10 Americans can pass the basic um, quiz of environmental knowledge. And the challenge with this is that they also asked the same group of American, oh, by the way, the folks in Kansas did only marginally better, about three point, um, uh, about 34% of Kansans versus 30% uh, of nationally can pass this um, quiz. But the point of this is they also asked, and we also asked, how much do you know about the environment? And the majority of the people who responded to this, about 75% of them said, I know quite a bit to a lot about the environment. So the challenge here is really significant in that people think they know a lot about the environment, but in fact, they don't. And so it's really important when we get to that, that piece of effective decision-making that we have people who are knowledgeable and have the skills and understanding to be able to make decisions that matter. So as important as knowledge is about environmental issues and the human aspects um, related to them, they have to be complemented by a positive and caring attitude toward the environment. So attitudes matter. And re research shows that these attitudes are formed really early in life. And so we want to be doing environmental education starting with very young kids. And the reasons why we wanna be doing environmental education is not only do the, does environmental education benefit the environment, but it's also just good education. Um, it's, it, it helps with all sorts of things from uh, increasing the knowledge and developing a land ethic to um, promoting uh, people who have higher levels of environmental knowledge are more likely to engage in um, pro-environmental behavior. So it's, it's important that um, we are doing that teaching starting at a very young age. And not only is environmental education um, great for learning about the environment, but it's actually just 
good for kids. <clears throat> These are some of the benefits that the um, a 2010 report from the National Wildlife Federation indicated um, uh, from research that we're finding about some of the positive benefits of environmental education to kids in schools. And you can see things like helping them to do better in math and science and even communications. Um, it's especially helpful and effective at, at, uh, in under-resourced um, schools for low-income students. They do better in school when you get them learning about the environment and get them learning outside. It can help with motivation. It can improve classroom behavior. Um, kids who are engaged don't get in trouble, get as much trouble. Um, and it also helps, as I, I sort of alluded to earlier, with um, helping with concentration and can mitigate some of the attention deficit challenges that kids have. Uh, in addition, um, it can, it's great across the disciplines. If you looked at the Tbilisi um, uh, definition of environmental education, it's not just about the science, it's also about the social sciences and the math and the English language arts. So it really does help across all the disciplines and it helps to create some real world problem solvers. Um, we found research that suggests that it helps so much with engagement that it can make students who are engaged regularly in environmental education less likely to drop out of school. It, it helps um, academic achievement and it, that shows up on standardized tests and it can even help improve performance on um, college entrance exams. So it's, it's good education. It's something we should be doing. Um, and um, this was a more recent study, and this came from, I'm really proud of this study because it came from a, uh, one of my colleagues in North Carolina was a part of the research group that did this, but um, <clears throat> they were demonstrating that when kids are learning about tough issues like climate change, that they can actually have a positive impact on um, what their parents think about climate change. And I thought that was just really fascinating. Um, they can especially have, and um, I thought this was really interesting, is that daughters were more effective than sons, and this merits some further research, um, and it's certainly emerging research, but that fathers and conservative parents were also the ones who showed the biggest changes in attitude. And so not only can the education that we do today help prepare our kids for tomorrow, but it can actually influence and help shift the way that parents are thinking about environmental issues. And then there was a meta-analysis that was done in 2019 of um, over a hundred different studies uh, related to doing environmental education and reported some really positive benefits. And, and probably the one that um, we care the most is that 83% uh, of the, the studies reported enhanced environmental related behaviors. Um, so they're not only just learning about it, they're doing it. So as, um, as Helen said, um, we call ourselves Casey all the time for obvious reasons. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, Helen mentioned we were founded in 1969. We are a public-private partnership. We have more than 500 individuals and organizational members. And we were actually founded by um, the Kansas State Department of Education. He was called the Superintendent of Public Education at that point. Um, and we, are, we were founded as an advisory council to the Department of Education. We're an affiliate of the North American Association for Environmental Education. So we're part of a larger system and network. Um, Here's our vision and mission because you have to see that when we talk about our organizations, but we are really um, about accelerating environmental literacy through non-biased and science-based environmental education in our state. Um, as Helen mentioned, we, we are engaged in a lot of different things. So we do professional development. Um, we do that with both formal educators, so classroom teachers and informal educators. Um, so folks who work in places like zoos and nature centers and Baker wetlands and programs like that. Um, and we do professional development to strengthen skills and pedagogy and teaching about the environment and also providing them with great resources for doing that. We do a number of networking events. Um, so we get environmental educators together 
um, Helen mentioned we have an annual conference every year for folks who are interested in environmental education to get together and learn from each other. We do a fair amount of leadership development. We want to keep that leadership pipeline going for um, uh, our organization, for sure, but for environmental education in the state. We do recognition programs um, to point out and acknowledge and honor the people who are doing amazing work in environmental education. We do a lot of resources and direct supports um, at different times. We're always looking for funding to provide grants to schools and to environmental educators. Um, we have a Kansas Green Schools Network, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And then we're also dipping our toes into a program that's called Environmental Issues Forums, which is using a deliberative dialogue process to talk about complex environmental issues. Um, and we've worked with the North American Association for Environmental Education um, to develop some issue guides around climate and also around water um, so far, and we're working on some additional ones. So um, speaking of recognition, and um, I hope Helen doesn't kill me for this, but we are really excited to honor um, Helen and her work at KU and her collaboration with um, Julie Schwarting at um, Free State High School in Lawrence and, um, and the amazing work that she's been doing with uh, working with those kids and the community <clears throat> to do some great environmental education around um, around the prairie. And so um, we really, I really wanted to highlight that. Um, we were really pleased to be able to honor her. Unfortunately, COVID happened, so we couldn't honor her in person this year, but we are sure looking forward to doing that next year when uh, it's safe for us to do so. So um, join me in congratulating her and um, an amazing accomplishment. So our Kansas Green Schools program, um, there's about, this is a, sorry, the numbers are not correct because we're over 450 now, we're up to about 419, or sorry, 519 schools and districts around the state. They opt into this program. You can kind of see where they are. They're scattered all over the place. Um, but these are schools that are interested in engaging students, investigating their schools and having students students develop action plans to lead the way for greener and healthier schools across um, uh, looking at energy, water, waste, uh, the school site and school health. So on the horizon of things that we're doing, we're working on expanding our green schools and we're looking at developing an early childhood green schools prob um, uh, program. Uh, we're working on expanding our school gardens, which are connected to the green schools and green centers. So we're looking at um, how can we engage um, community-based um, centers to work with green schools in their area. Um, we're also doing a program that's called Kansas Wild. Um, uh, it was started by a superintendent, actually, um, when we challenged uh, some educators to think about how we can get students out uh, learning and experiencing um, the outdoors more. He models it after FFA, but it was it's really focused on nature and natural resources, and it has uh, components of student experiences and learning in the outdoors and service and then leadership um, among those students. So I know that I buzzed through all of that very quickly, um, and, but I'm happy to talk with any of you at any time. And these are also the other staff that we have. Um, some of you might recognize some of these names, but um, we're, we're always happy to talk with you about the work that we do. And then if you're doing um, some great environmental education, um, and want us to know about it and be able to share that, that's another venue for you to be able to do that. So that, Helen, is all I have. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. So if anybody has any questions, just a reminder, you're welcome to just uh, unmute and ask, or um, uh, you can also send in the chat and we'd be happy to, to read them out as well. So actually, um, this is Helen Alexander. I, first of all, I wanted to thank you for uh, promoting <laughs> our Free State Project. Thank you much on that. Um, many of the people in this audience have also supported that uh, as well. Um, I was just curious. I, I can send you a separate email about this, but you had some great references in that uh, talk that I was not aware of. Um, 
do you easily have a way to share some of the references that you uh, mentioned? Most of them. <laughs> I can, I, yes, most of them, Helen. I can I can get that updated. I'd be happy to do that and share that back with you to share with um, anyone who would like that for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Do you, when you guys, you know, you have all these schools across the state, it seems to me that you might be able to, um, you probably have some really good insights on what things work where, right? It, it's likely, right, that, you know, different kinds of educational experiences work out in, you know, Hayes or Junction City than work in, you know, Wyandotte or, you know, KCK or those kind of areas. Do you guys have, do you ever do any kind of analyses of that or at least some graphics, even qualitatively of like, wow, these sets of kinds of activities, like gardening, right? That maybe those work really well in some places, but not in others. Those are, would be really helpful, I think, for some of us that, that are trying to do work across the state as part of the Kansas Biological Survey, or even writing grants and thinking about where we can go to put particular kinds of research into practice with students in education. So like, um, I, I wish we did more of that. Um, we are a, a lean and mean organization. The, the four staff that we have covers the whole state. So we don't get to spend a whole lot of time doing analysis, but man, would we love to work with somebody at say a university um, who was interested <laughs> in doing some of that kind of analysis um, because it's important information to have for sure. But um, um, we, have, we have found that in general, like school gardening goes everywhere. We've got examples of people doing school gardening all over the place. And um, uh, just to address that one, but um, no, we unfortunately, Ben, we're not super great at doing data analysis like that. Yeah, that's okay. We can't do everything. It's just, you have this distributed thing. If maybe even it, it makes sense to try and think about since you have that network, maybe there are grants or maybe there are things too that could, could help facilitate giving you guys a little bit of space and breathing room to like actually look at those things in collaboration. Yeah. We would okay, love thanks. to. Yep. We would awesome. love to. So and, Laura, I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, you know, looking at how, you know, you don't have very many people, but your reach is so big. How, how is it that you get, how do you interact with people? So is it mostly that you talk with you, you have workshops and share information with teachers, um, do you go to classrooms? Because I find that, you know, we go and visit like 250 students, you know, around just this area in, you know, just not very many schools compared to how many there are. And it's, it's a huge endeavor. So how do you do it? Well, we conscientiously made the choice to, um, to use a model where we work primarily with the educators. So um, we work with teachers and then we work with educators in zoos and nature centers and folks like you, Peggy, we'd love to work with. And, uh, and so we work with the educators and not directly with students. So we provide really good training and support for those educators and opportunities to collaborate and get together and then um, let them go forth and uh, multiply that impact, so. Thank you. And I, I think I took way too much time Rob, please don't kill me. Um, <laughs> so I would be happy to um, uh, converse with you further in any way that you would like, um, but I will turn it over to Rob now and, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, okay. thank you, Laura. I know you have to run off. Thanks so much. Um, we'll also, if you have some contact information you can send on to us, we can hand it out to people that are interested as well. We don't want to post it on KBS's website, but we'll uh, be happy to, uh, to pass it on because I know others may have questions. You can pass so, it. You can put it wherever you want. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Um, Take Bye. care. So next up is going to be uh, Rob Ramos, and uh, I think his advisor, Jim, is going to give him a proper intro. Yeah, I'm very happy to introduce Rob. Uh, Rob is working on the dynamics of mycorrhizal fungi and then their feedbacks on, on plant growth, and that's what he's going to present about today. All right. Thank you, Jim. Go ahead and start sharing here. Um, can everyone see my slides? <clears throat> um, I'm not hearing complaints, so I assume people can. All right. 
So like Jim said, my name is Robert Ramos. I'm a PhD student in the Beaver Schultz lab and I'm working on uh, these mutualistic soil fungus called arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and uh, their interactions with plants and how they might be shaping uh, plant community dynamics. So, um, so plant soil feedback. So in, for um, my purposes, I'm going to define plant soil feedbacks as you know, the set of mechanisms that uh, can shape patterns of biodiversity, including successional changes. And they, uh, in the framework I want to think about them, they can operate in, a, in the sense of a plant affecting a soil community. So soil microbes either eating uh, the roots of the plants or you know, partnering with the plant or because of things, you know, root exudates or any number of things, plants are shaping the soil community below them. And then that soil community can have a feedback effect on those plants and they might, you know, they might have no effect. They might increase the fitness of that, of that plant um, disproportionately to its other competitors. And if it does that, you would expect a positive feedback effect. So plant change in the soil community, that change now increases this fitness. Um, and if you see that, you, you'll, you could, you could theor theorize a scenario where you could even lead to competitive exclusion because you got these plants that uh, as they get more dominant, they increase their fitness even more and they keep getting better and better. You can also hey, Rob, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're seeing like a, a, rec, a black rectangle on the right side of your presentation. It might be your Zoom participants that you need to minimize or something, but it's yes, blocking can, out some of the words. I can try my best to get rid of that. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, and then you could think of a negative feedback scenario where you plant changes the soil community, but that soil community now disproportionately negatively impacts its fitness compared to its competitors. So now you're seeing where a plant gets more dominant, its fitness actually decreases. And you can imagine all kinds of uh, scenarios where that could lead to um, multiple plants coexisting because as any one plant gets too dominant, its fitness goes down, other plants have space to, to, to bounce back. So to kind of frame my thinking for my research, I'm leaning heavily on a model developed by uh, Dr. Beaver that uh, tries to formulate this relationship between multiple host guilds and multiple mutualist guilds and how these fitness relationships between them, uh, whether or not they're symmetric can lead to different predictions for the outcome of community dynamics. So in a symmetric scenario, which is what I'm depicting on the left, let's say we have uh, host plant one. Now host plant one has a positive impact on mutualist A and mutualist A has the greatest benefit to host one. And these, and the same is true for host two and a mutualist two, a mutualist B in this scenario, we're gonna get positive feedback in this scenario where if either host plant is dominant, it changes the soil community that in a way that benefits it's preferentially. And we end up with uh, either overperformance or competitive exclusion potentially. There's another scenario that we can explore though, which is where these relationships are not symmetric. So let's say again, host one, host one, positively impacts mutualist A. Mutualist A grows really well in the presence of host one, but mutualist A actually increases the fitness of host two preferentially. So the benefit to host two is greater than the benefit to host one. Well, now we get a situation where you might see negative feedback. So host one is dominant in the system. Mutualist A pro uh, profligates because of that and, mutualist a, and because of that, host two's fitness is increasing. So host one's dominance is actually increasing uh, the relative competitive advantage of host two. And you can see scenarios now where you might see um, uh, negative feedback and those kind of dynamics. So that's why I wanted to study AMF. And uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to study AMF and why I'm interested in them in this context of plant soil feedbacks. So uh, another, another important factor here is AM fungi are mutualist and they provide, the primary benefit they provide to host plants is nutrients, specifically phosphorus. They're very good at providing phosphorus. Um, so host plants have also in previous research been shown to be able to modulate their, uh, basically they give sugars in exchange for phosphorus and they can modulate that through different mechanisms depending on their need for phosphorus at the time. So if plants are able to modulate the amount of benefit they're giving to mutualists and mutualists are less needed in a high phosphorus environment, we kind of have this prediction that if we expose our plants to elevated levels of phosphorus, we might actually see poor mutualists profligate because the, the more beneficial mutualists aren't getting the reinforcement from, the, from their host plants. So that's a, 
another uh, aspect of these community dynamics we want to in, in, uh, investigate be, uh, because phosphorus is such an important part of this particular mutualism. So that's a general framework of uh, the question I was interested in. Um, and how do I wanna test all these different interactions and more specifically the characteristics of the host plants that could make you, that could lead to predictions of how these different uh, plant soil feedbacks might, uh, might re resolve. So to test some of these interactions, I'm leaning on a, uh, a feedback experimental design that is used heavily in the Beaver Schultz lab. And that is this two phase feedback design. Um, we use this a lot, uh, it's very, useful in that you can take field soil, or in my case, we're actually taking sterile soil that we're inoculating with known cultures. So we know exactly who's present. And you, in phase one, you grow out the plants in your experiment, and then you allow the soil community to grow for a, gro a whole growing season to really fully differentiate based on their association with the host plant. So you give them plenty of time so that whatever changes are gonna happen in that micro uh, or in that soil community in general can happen and then at the end of that season, you collect the soil after the plant senesces. And then you have phase two, which is a, which is a growth assay. So you take the same, spread, the same uh, array of plants that you started with, and now you grow them again, but this time in the soil, you inoculate them with those soil communities that you conditioned in the phase one experiment. So now you have these differentiated soil communities, and now you're gonna test how well or poorly do these plants do in association with all these different differentiated communities. So that's the general free framework of this design. Since I only have uh, a short time today, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about the results mostly from the phase one experiment, uh, where we're gonna look at how these different soil communities that start, they start the same because they're starting from the same set of cultures differentiate based on the host plant and the characteristics of those host plants. So we wanted to test a quite a different uh, number of uh, features of different plants, so we had a pick a wider way of, array of host plants. So we picked, um, uh, it's actually 39 species, that's a typo there, I apologize. Uh, 39 species of plants across um, several plant families. We grouped them here in what we're in these kind of super families for convenience. So we have grasses lumped together. We have um, other monocots that we're calling lilies, legumes, milkweeds, mints, and asters. Um, and within these super groups, we made sure we made we picked out some plants that had uh, big sh uh, early successional plants and plants that are late successional plants. And we have a few non-natives as well. And in general, we're treating the non-natives as early successional species. So we picked this wider way, array of plant species to be able to test all these different uh, plant characteristics and how they're affecting the, the, the community, uh, the soil communities. Um, in terms of our soil community, we picked seven AMF species that we have grown in culture and we have used in previous ex experiments. The benefit of doing that is that we have some idea of in general, how well they are, how good they are promoting growth in responsive plants. So we have these seven species. Um, we have some idea of how good of a mutualist they are. And so when we see the changes in the soil communities, we might be able to make some kind of inference on, um, is this an improvement in the soil community in terms of mutualistic quality or, uh, or is it degrading? Um, so, that is why we went with these seven species. And again, we're starting this experiment with the same community across the board. So just to reiterate, this experiment is gonna be testing this first part, this downward host effect on the plant soil community and how are the mutualists responding to the presence of this host plant. So uh, the experiment, uh, again, we took our 39 plant species, our seven species of AMF fungi, they were all plants were exposed to the same mixture of our seven inocula. And uh, we added a phosphorus treatment as well. And then we added four replicates on top. So that's the overall experiment of the design. We grew this for an entire growing season. Uh, when the plants the nest, we collected the soil, reserved some of it for a feedback experiment down the road. And then we did, bio, we did uh, sequencing on that soil to get community information about the AMF fungi that were present. Um, so if people haven't worked with AM, our AM fungi or sequencing data in general, what this means is that we ended up amplifying a region of the genome. And in case for AM fungi, we rely on the, uh, the part of the genome that codes for the ribosomal large subunit. Uh, we use this region of the genome because previous research has shown it's really good at identifying different AM, AMF species. Um, it's unusual because for other fungal groups, people typically use the ITS region of the ribosomal gene and um, there are really good tools and really large 
uh, libraries that you can reference your sequences against to try to identify what species are there. You can't rely on those tools when you use the LSU, so we have to use smaller libraries without as much coverage to try to identify species. As that is a limitation, in our case, we were able to identify OTUs or oper operational taxonomic units, um, which are basically just patterns of sequences you see over and over again in your sequence data um, that are up to a certain threshold similar. So that we say that they're same if they're more than 95, 99% similar. Um, and identify those OTUs to individual species. We were able to do that for um, four species, but an additional three, we couldn't get past a single grouping. So our two species of Chlordiglomus and Entropospora in sequence were all clumped together in what we're, for uh, simplicity's sake, calling Chlordiglomus genus. Um, and we were, able to identify, we were able to do our statistics based on those groupings. Um, it is important to know, though, that Chlordiglomus group is larger than the rest because we know that we, we suspected other multiple species in there. Um, it also happens to be all the species that have the highest mutualistic quality based on previous research. So that group is special in that way as well. So we identified all of our species. We have how often those sequences showed up in our, in our samples when we ran them through the Illumina sequencer. So we have some idea of how abundant they were. So did our experimental factors, this, the plant uh, uh, characteristics influence how the AM fungal community is diverged? So when you get our data out, you get something, something like this. Um, so this is a plot of the relative abundance of those different OT, uh, different OTU groupings based on plant species. And, um, and now we, you know, we, we see differences, but we now we want to test all these different experimental factors. So there's a couple of different ways you can approach this. Um, what we started with is that we went ahead and grouped all of our plant species into these large superfamilies. I have them color coded here. Um, and then because this is a multi-level factor, you can use a lot of different statistical tools that you would be used to to analyze this data. Um, we used Pormanova, and that's the data, I'm gonna, that's the results I'm going to show you first. Um, and that allows us to test the changes across all the OTU species at once um, and how they're responding to our experimental factors. And, um, but there's another way of approaching this data that I'll talk about after, which is going to incorporate more of the actual phylogenetic information involved in that phylogenetic tree you see on the left-hand side of your screen. So uh, we'll touch on that after I talk about the Permanova results, but first we're going to talk about these Permanovas that use these broad superfamilies as a, as a, as a category. So in general, when we look at the Permanova results, uh, we saw some interesting significant factors. Uh, I'm just going to highlight here for everybody, uh, ignoring block, because uh, that wasn't really uh, uh, an experimental manipulation. Um, in the first year, we see that the, the plant phylogenetic group does have a statistically significant effect on AM fungal community composition. So different families differ in similar ways. Um, individual plant species also have a great deal of variation, but even given that individ individual species variation, we see some variation that's statistically significant based on those, those large phylogenetic groups. Interestingly, when you take the second year, because uh, these experiment was repeated for a second year to see if the strength, any of the strengths of these effects got uh, improved or de declined with time, um, especially with the, with the late sessional species that tend to be perennial species. So these associations occur in nature all for multiple years. So we figured that we felt that that was an important uh, aspect to try to capture in the experiment. When we tested the second year effects, we found that the plant origin, so whether these plants were native or non-native species, also had a significant effect on the overall community structure. So that was very interesting. We were, it was really cool to see that. Um, we also noticed that when we we're analyzing this data, we have these big categories of AM fungal species, um, but there's multiple OTUs within every one of those, not every one of those, within three of those categories, they have multiple OTUs that we're calling a single group. Um, we wanted to take, test how much variation is within those groups, especially Chlordiglomus knowing that we, we likely have multiple species within that group. So we went ahead and ran Permanovas on those three fungal species groups that have multiple OTUs. I can present that for you guys now. Um, Chlordiglomus first, this is the big, big group with multiple species that have some of the best mutualistic uh, quality to it. Um, again, we see plant group is statistically significant along with plant species. And year two, plant origin, again, marginally significant um, but only in year two. We also found this interaction effect 
that was significant. Um, so plant establishment, whether or not it's an early or late successional plant, was significant when you looked at its interaction with phosphorus. So early, early plant species behave differently under phosphorus um, when compared to late successional species when they were exposed to phosphorus or not. So very interesting results. Um, and this is only within the OTUs that we classify as chlorodigloma. So there's definitely variation inside that group that we didn't capture in the previous Permanova. Very interesting results. When we move on to looking at our Fulgula species, again, we don't think there's multiple species here. We think in this case, it's probably interspecies variation. But even there, within, the, within that species categorization, categorization excuse me, uh, we did see plant group, uh, post-plant phylogenetic group is significantly affecting the mycorrhizal community composition. And in this case, plant establishment had a main effect um, that was statistically significant in the second year. So whether or not the host plant was early or late successional, which is interesting because it's not varying the same between the chlorodiglomus group and the fulgida group, showing that individual AM fungal species um, or species groups are behaving differently based on different plant characteristics from their host plants. And again, we see um, a plant group by phosphorus. So this is, um, these phylogenetic groups are behaving differently with a marginal significance of 0.1 um, when they're exposed to phosphorus or not. And then finally, uh, Mossier was our last group that had multiple OTUs associated with it. Uh, similarly, plant phylogenetic group is significant. And then in year two, uh, whether they're early or late successional plants become significant. And then we did see this plant native or non-native status interacting with phosphorus being statistically significant as well. So this, these analyses looked at multiple, um, multiple species, AM fungal species and how their total community composition is varying over time. We saw significant results, so we were very excited. Um, but I mentioned that there's another way of analyzing this data as well. Um, that tries to account not only for these broad characterizations of phylogenetic group, but actually takes information from the tree to see how much the species that are more or less distantly related um, might be affecting community composition. So we wanted to take that into account. So talking about that, pro uh, that process that we went through. So we're interested in how fungal, AM fungal OTUs um, are more or less similar if they are, the abundances are more or less similar if the species um, are more or less closely related. This is a more complicated statistical problem to solve. So what we ended up having to use was this uh, process that uses a MCMC GLMM and takes a distance matrix. So I'll go through exactly how that's calculated in a minute, but it's basically a, a matrix that includes all these different uh, measurements of relatedness between all the different species combinations. You take that matrix add it in as a random effect into this model. And you can test whether or not this random effect is statistically significant. So whether or not, in general, phylogenetic relatedness is affecting community composition of the AM fungal species. So phylogenetic distance, if people aren't very familiar with it, you have a phylogenetic tree like this. And then you take any two species on this tree and you can draw a line between them. If you measure the distance of that line, the way this tree is calculated, the branch lengths, the lengths of those lines are basically metrics of similarity. How similar are the sequences between, in this case, Elemis and Baptisia? And you can use that as a proxy for how related they are. If, there's a speech, if the sequences are, are more divergent, we assume that they're more distantly related. So you calculate all, all those distances between all the combinations, and you end up with your matrix, and you use that as your random effect. So when we did that, all the, the random effects for basically every every um, AM fungal species, uh, because we had to do this by species, this is a, not a multivariate approach like a Promanova, this is a univariate approach. So we're looking at individual AM fungal species independently. Every one of those had the random effect come up as significant. So in every case, the phylogenetic relatedness of the different species is statistically affecting the AM fungal uh, abundances of each of these different AM fungal species. Um, we also looked at the fixed effects of our experimental design. And again, we're doing this by AM fungal species. We see similar patterns, um, plant origin, plant, uh, plant, so plant origin, whether it's native, um, is statistically significant as is um, whether or not it's late successional and exposed to phosphorus 
or whether or not it is uh, native and exposed to phosphorus. For Clodoglomus, um, for Spinoza, we didn't see any significant results, which is interesting. Um, of the of the fixed effects. For Pellucida, again, we see pretty much only in the case of plant um, early versus uh, late when exposed to phosphorus or not. So that interaction of those two factors. For Fulgida, we see plant origin having a statistically significant effect. Um, so the, the native species being statistically significant, statistically different than the non-native species. And finally, uh, for Mossy, our final uh, AM fungal species, origin and this interaction between um, early and late sessional species when exposed to phosphorus and not was, was marginally significant. So uh, again, this is a slightly different analysis than before. We're not looking at multiple OTUs together. So we're not looking at composition per se. We're just looking at the changes in individual abundances, uh, logic transformed in our case. So the quick summary of these results, AM fungal communities are responding to host properties, uh, including phylogenetic grouping, um, or if we analyze it in a different way, uh, directly this measure of relatedness, which is our phylogenetic distance, and phosphorus levels, particularly in interaction with these other, other um, plant host characteristics. So um, there was one case where we saw a general effect of phosphorus addition, but generally it's, it's, effect, it's being affected by differently, but depending on different host plant characteristics. Um, and also interestingly, AM fungal species, they're not responding to the same host plant characteristics across the board. Different AM fungal species are sensitive to different parts of the host plant um, characteristics. So very interesting results, very exciting to see. Um, we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna really quickly just talk about some things, that, some of the next steps. So we were able to see AM fungal community uh, composition is changing based on our host plants. So are we seeing feedback effects? So in terms of the feedback effects, just to re-anchor uh, ourselves to the framework of this inter species model. We're now looking at how the mutualist and differential levels of the mutualist are going to in fact impact the fitness of the host plants. In our case, fitness is gonna be how well they grow, so biomass. Um, this experimental design is gonna take the soil communities from phase one and going to uh, use them as inocula across all the species um, in the experiment to see how these different soil communities affect um, uh, plant growth, basically. And we're going to, we're, our metric is going to be mycorrhizal responsiveness. So it's actually a ratio. So we're going to take the ratio of a sterile control versus inoculated species to see how much better a plant does when exposed to these AM fungi. So that's going to be our, our metric. And just some early uh, analysis. I still have a lot more analysis I want to run on this experiment. Uh, in general, we're seeing uh, a, a trend towards positive feedback. So if a host plant is grown in a soil community that had been associated with the same species of host plant in the, in the phase one, it does better. And it tends to do, and, and across the board, they tend to be, do the worst when they're exposed to a plant species, uh, a host plant species trained AMF, let me rephrase that. They tend to do worst in an AM fungal community that had a previous host that was part of the same family but not the same species that is currently growing in the soil. Now, interestingly, when you're looking at the plant communities, different host plant communities respond differently to previous uh, host plant, um, different current host plants respond differently based on the history of the AM, AM, AMF soil community. So if you break out the current hosts by family, you'll see in, for example, when you're growing a legume, the legume does the best actually uh, relatively, when it's grown in soil that was trained on the same species of legume. Otherwise, it tends to, to do worse. So we're seeing an uh, example here of positive feedback. Legumes do really well in soil that was trained on that same species of legume. Poesi, for uh, in, in contrast, uh, so grasses, they tend to do best when they're grown in soil that was not grown with a grass. So we're seeing evidence of Poesi of negative feedback. So this is also exciting. We're starting to see like different plant families are having different general reactions to this history of AM fungal communities and which host plants had generated this community beforehand. So very exciting. And just to add to our conclusions here, now preliminary analysis of the feedback effects on plants show that these different differentiated AMF fungal communities see different response types between plants of different phylogenetic groups. So very exciting. Uh, still a lot of work to do, but uh, I'm excited with the progress we've made so far. 
And I, at that, I will thank everyone and be open for questions. Well done. Well done, Rob. Um, does anybody have any questions? Rob, you're welcome to just call on, on people yourself. Right, let me open up the chat window here. Or if people can sing out if they have a question or two. I just have a real quick question as someone who doesn't study mycorrhizae. So you had phosphorus effects in interactions, but it didn't seem like a, a huge effect. And But I, I realize this is mainly looking at phase one where you're focusing on the, um, the fungal community. So when you do the phase two experiment, do you have presence and absence of phosphorus? So we actually did two experiments for phase two, um, just, just limited of size. We couldn't do an experiment that combined all the species yeah. combinations and the phosphorus combination. So we did an experiment where we took one species. In our case, we decided to go with little blue and uh, we went ahead and trained, we went ahead and grew it up on all the soil combinations, including the phosphorus and non-phosphorus. We saw interesting results. I'm still analyzing that data. Um, it is a, it, it, we do see statistically significant effects. Um, they're kind of counterintuitive based on our uh, pre-existing assumptions. So one of the things we found was that late successional plants, um, if the soil community was trained on a late successional plant and exposed to phosphorus, those soil communities tend to be better promoters of growth. Hmm. Um, which we're finding it, well, <laughs> this, this result keeps coming up in experiments. Something like this result keeps coming up in experiments. So it's definitely happening. We're trying to understand it. I, I'm actually working with Jen to see if maybe we can can get a, a project funded to go ahead and take some of these soil this, some of these soil communities and just test them to see on different forms of phosphorus. With the assumption being a maybe maybe what we're seeing is a, as an AM fungal species that's specializing on inorganic phosphorus, which is what we're adding to these pots, and maybe that explains why they become better promoters because in the presence of this inorganic phosphorus, they're they're doing really well, uh, huh. especially since we're dealing with late successional species that tend to be more mycorrhizal responsive. So they tend to need AMF even in the presence of fertilization that might explain it. But that's that's an hypothesis. We really haven't figured it out yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks for a presentation, Rob. Yeah, I've thought about that actually a long time ago uh, about those phosphorus forms. I think it's really interesting because they're, you know, rock phosphate is, is kind of the ultimate source of a lot. But I, I had a question about your data actually addressed a question that I have always wondered, which is in the training phase, if you keep training, whether or not you keep kind of changing, right? Or you just mm -hmm. change, like basically one year is enough to change it as much as you can. I found it really interesting that in round two in the second year, you basically explain twice as much variation by plant identity as you did in year one. I think that's fascinating. And you would, you know, the question is, is how far you go with that, right? Like, at some point you assume that it must asymptote, right? And it doesn't just keep doubling its effects of plant identity. But the fact that it does from year one to year two means that it has all kinds of consequences for perennial, perennial plants or biennial plants versus annual plants. It has consequences for even how we do feedback studies in that even if we don't see an effect in the greenhouse from one year of training, in reality, in the field, we might see even stronger effects if you get a double training, you know, like would normally happen with a population. So to me, that tells you that feedback measurements that we do in greenhouses are probably conservative, right, on, on, on how much they're changing communities and then how much those community changes could feed back. So I, I don't know if you have any comments on that. I just found that really, really fascinating, actually. No, I, I definitely agree. I think... Um... I hope it's conservative because that that bodes well for the for us do do those kind of experiments. I think it I think I think it's right. I think it's the the changes seem to be getting stronger over time. The 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 these 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 linkage between the, the plant and the soil community and then back to the plant and the feedback seems to be getting stronger the more years that they're exposed to each other. So yeah, it's very it's very interesting. And it's it's a nice proof of concept to do it in a greenhouse and show that even in a greenhouse, you do this for multiple years, you see stronger results. Yeah. And the the amount though of the the What'd you call it? The meta group or the hyper group or super family meta group? The super whatever. family that didn't explain much more in year two. It was just the identity that keeps kind of coming on stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah. So, anyways, I, I thought that was very cool. Um, 
Oh, sorry, Jude had a question. I think I want to say uh, I should have stopped the video. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Not not because I don't want to record you, Jude. That's a good idea.